Well, at least many stock portfolios have immunity to the coronavirus. Marketplace Morning Report is supported by LegalZoom. New challenges face people these days. LegalZoom's network of attorneys can provide advice when people need it right from home. More information is available at LegalZoom.com. I'm David Brancaccio. In an about face, the head of the U.S. Postal Service says he will hold off cost-cutting measures until after the fall election. So opening hours and the blue mailboxes won't be reduced, nor will overtime for employees for now. The post office is one of the biggest employers in the U.S., and its staff includes a large number of military veterans. Marketplace's Justin Ho reports on that. The USPS says it employs over 97,000 veterans. That's roughly a sixth of its workforce. Michael Mako is one of them. He's worked as a sales and service associate in Kentucky for nearly 17 years. I basically managed the window service to the public. Mako says he spent five years on active duty in the U.S. Army. When he became a civilian, he says the Postal Service was the best paying job he could find. And Mako says he's used a lot of skills he picked up in the military. Leadership, multitasking, attention to detail. Whether you're mailing firearms, corrosives, hazardous materials, there's so many things that you have to stay on top of. Many veterans haven't served long enough to receive a military pension, says Jeffrey Wenger at the RAND Corporation. He says the federal pension the USPS offers makes the job attractive to veterans. I think pension is important. I think people want that sense of stability and security. Michael Mako says he was able to count his five years of active duty time toward his postal retirement. I'm Justin Ho for Marketplace. Both the S&P 500 stock index and the NASDAQ composite index both hit record highs yesterday, which is notable given the great drop that occurred in that first month when the coronavirus hit the U.S. hard. Why would people buy stocks now, given the mess we remain in? It's in part because what you get from bonds these days is so low. Here's Michael Hewson at CMC Markets. What is going on, I think, is what could be called a flight to yield-bearing assets. When interest rates are at record lows or, in real terms, negative when adjusted for inflation, investors are running out of assets to put their money Let's do this morning's numbers. U.S. stock index futures are all up in the one-tenth of one percent range. Actually, the Dow future is up 43 points, nearly two-tenths of a percent. Did hit, did not. The Dow did not hit a record yesterday. The benchmark for 10-year interest rates is at 0.65 percent this morning, up just slightly, but still very low. Marketplace Morning Report is supported by Fidelity Wealth Management, where advisors work with their clients to develop flexible investment strategies that can evolve as their needs change. Learn more at fidelity.com slash wealth. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC. And by C3.ai. C3.ai software enables organizations to use artificial intelligence at enterprise scale, solving previously unsolvable business problems. Learn more at C3.ai. As we continue talking to a range of people about getting the economy we want, not just the one we had, let's turn to an architect and designer whose low-key wisdom has had a wide impact on the sustainability movement. William McDonough did an environmental studies building at Oberlin College in Ohio some years ago that controls its waste and generates more energy than it consumes. His book from 2002 is a pivotal text in the sustainability movement. It's called Cradle to Cradle, Remaking the Way We Make Things as part of our Reimagining the Economy series, and wanted to hear more about what McDonough calls the circular economy. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. What should people understand about what you are calling the circular economy? What we've been doing is take, make, waste. That's a linear economy. What we're saying is materials and things, you can take them from nature, and then we make things with them, But when we're finished with the use of it, we can start to imagine what its next use is and design it for its next use. And that's what's so much fun. And then you end up with a circular economy. It's for intergenerational benefit. Now, you know, I think of you as an architect with buildings, and I've seen one of your buildings at uh, Oberlin College in Ohio that, you know, is an expression of this, but you've thought a lot about apparel that could be really have this almost infinite cycle. Tell me a little bit more about that. Well, for textiles, we created, I created with the CNA Foundation something called Fashion for Good in Amsterdam. 
1994, we did our first textile for Steelcase Corporation uh, here in the States, furniture company. And we designed uh, with them a fabric that was so clean you could eat it. And then all the dyes and the mordants and the rinses and the polishes are all so clean that the water coming out of the factory is as clean as Swiss drinking water. So guess what? You turn right around and now you don't need water anymore and you're not polluting the local lake or having inspectors to worry about it, which saves money because there's nothing to inspect. So this is like that building in Oberlin. It's a building like a tree. A tree, you know, collects more energy from solar energy than it requires to live. It actually accrues and grows. Amazing. And it purifies water, provides habitat. That's what we want to design systems that are like that. They're regenerative. So if this pandemic is some kind of opportunity to embrace what policymakers had deemed unthinkable before, because there's a lot of new thinking, at least I'm told that, how do you want us to dive further into this once we get out of this pandemic phase? I think it's clear now that energy has to be clean. And we should do it in ways to give jobs to everybody. There's so much to do in renewable power. There is so little to do in coal. So focus and safety and health first. Then we look for the circular economy. You can do this. We can do them all at once. And it can be very highly profitable. William McDonough, architect and visionary, with Michael Browngard. He also wrote a book about designing for abundance titled The Upcycle. Mr. McDonough, thank you so much. Thank you. And in the coming days and weeks on public radio stations nationwide, listen for three special reports from Marketplace. My colleague Kai Rizdal has one addressing structural discrimination. Our Molly Wood looks at tech solutions to help pull us from the grips of the pandemic. And my team here has the economy reimagined. I'm David Brancaccio. This is the Marketplace Morning Report. From APM, American Public Media.